Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's great to see everybody here. Loud, am I okay? Okay. Um, so I don't have to say anything else. It was all on that amazing segment, uh, uh, which was done about a year ago. So that's right when we were declared a federal state of emergency, which was January um, of 2016. Um, a lot has happened since then, and there's still quite a bit to share. So to help me kind of get a better sense of who's here, um, medical students, can we raise your hand? Yeah, also medical students. Uh, residents? No residents? They're all working over 80 hours. Okay, one. Uh, pediatric faculty, peds people, all, anybody in the peds world? Okay. Uh, other faculty, staff, community people, any other person I did not count? I have to see some really cute kids. Okay. Undergrads, undergrads? You guys look really young. I'm like, no? Okay. <laughs> Great, whatever. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's great to see such a diverse crowd um, of people who are interested in this topic. Um, and it's an honor to be your MLK Health Equity Lecture. We have so much to learn from MLK and so many incredible um, words and, and work, uh, his work that, that is applicable today that I hope to share. So I, by now, obviously, even after this video, um, you're largely familiar with what happened in Flint. Um, and I want to share with you a little more about Flint's history. Uh, I want to share with you how the American dream, or a version of the American dream, um, was born in Flint. I want to share how we are working really hard to rebuild that dream. But most importantly, I want to share how your work and what we do today um, as public health advocates, as those in medicine, um, is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, so there's a lot that I want to share, and I hope I have you for at least the next three or four hours. I'm just going to All right. So we kind of got to just say, so before, before the water crisis, what was Flint famous for? Cars. Cars. Uh, cars. 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 <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get to, to trauma surgeon. We talked about all the penetrating injuries. So actually, before the water lead crisis, we were treating kids in Flint um, with high lead levels because of retained bullets. So we do have some crime issues. Um, so before, well, Flint is most famous for cars. So we were the birthplace of General Motors. General Motors was born in Flint. So Flint helped make the state of Michigan, helped make our country really into a powerhouse. Um, we put really the whole world on wheels, and that was in Flint. So. What else, after being creating cars, was Flint famous for b before the crime, <laughs> but related to the cars? Michael Moore. Well, after, before Michael Moore. <laughs> Unions. Who said that? Awesome. So um, in December of 1936, so we just celebrate. We have to talk. So we just celebrated actually the 80th anniversary of this historic moment. Um, the workers in General Motors plants took over and occupied a series of car plants. Um, and they had something called sit-down strikes, all right? So for 44 days, they sat on the cold Michigan winter floor of these plants, very similar to your Vermont winters, um, and they were demanding living wages, and they were demanding occupational health and safety, and they were demanding um, workers' rights. And management at that time tried to, they beat them up, they froze them out, um, and they tried to starve them out. And it took the personal intervention of the then governor of Michigan and President Roosevelt to end that strike. And in the end, the unions won. The UAW was created. Um, and for the first time, workers had access to the American dream. So many people argue that the middle class was born in Flint. Um, so what became of that um, was living wages, uh, benefits, pensions, affordable housing, health care, um, things that nobody had really dreamed of um, before that historic moment. Um, and this was actually called the grand bargain. Um, it was an amazing, amazing deal. And these fought, fought for wages informed the wages um, for the rest of the country for decades. Um, so Flint was this amazing, amazing place to live. Um, but I don't want to exaggerate because even back then in the, in the 30s, um, and if you could take yourself back to the 30s, the, the climate, Flint's prosperity was not shared equally by all. Um, the manufacturing jobs were segregated. Schools and neighborhoods were segregated. And those plants spewed tons of toxins into the environment, um, predominantly impacting the poor um, and the brown. But even so, um, 
Flint was something special. Um, it was hailed as one of America's great industrial cities, a promised land in the great migration north, and really for immigrants all over the world. They came to Flint for great living wage jobs, for great infrastructure and great schools. The model of community schools was actually born in Flint in the 1930s, and that spread all over the country. At one point, Flint had the highest per capita income in the nation the highest per capita income in the nation and some of the best public health indices in the nation as well. He, he, amazing, amazing, amazing history in Flint. But then, um, then Michael Moore comes in, uh, and, then, and, then, and then the crime comes in. So what happened in Flint is what happened in, in many of our post-manufacturing cities. Um, but Flint, um, Flint's decline came earlier and Flint's decline went lower. Um, so we suffered from disinvestment, uh, unemployment, high rates of poverty, racism, uh, decline of unions, population loss, uh, violent crime. So we are one of the top three violent crime rates uh, in the country. The military special ops medics, so like the Army Rangers, Navy SEALs, each team has to have a medic. They actually train in Flint because it's essentially a war zone on our streets. Um, like was mentioned, we have no grocery stores. We have a 60% poverty rate for our children. Um, so Flint is where our inequality problems, our injustice problems are most striking. A person who lives in Flint has a 15 year less life expectancy than a person in an adjacent zip code. 15 years. This, this is nobody's dream. So in 2011, uh, because of really this dire state, um, Flint was almost bankrupt. Um, and in Michigan, if your city is almost bankrupt, um, the state can take you over. Uh, so the governor appointed a financial emergency manager um, for the city of Flint, and overnight, the right of every American to have a say in their government was usurped. Democracy was entirely usurped. Um, and at one point in Michigan, over half of our African American population was under emergency management, whereas only 2% of our white population was under emergency management. It's absolutely mind boggling. And that emergency manager had one job. It was austerity. It was to save money, no matter what the cost. Um, and they severed this half a century relationship that we had with, with Detroit, where we were getting pre-treated fresh Great Lakes water for half a century. Um, and they decided that water was too expensive. Um, and they decided to switch to the local Flint River to draw our water. And the Flint River would have been fine if it was treated properly. Not optimal, but it would have been fine if it was treated properly. But like we heard, it wasn't treated properly. It was missing an important ingredient called corrosion control. Um, and I've learned way, way too much about water engineering. Um, so corrosion control is something that is in all of our water. Um, and it's like a, you can think of it like a medicine that you put in the water to prevent the pipes from corroding. It seals the pipes. Um, so this important ingredient, and nobody knows why, um, was not added to the treatment of the Flint water. And it's really a no-brainer kind of in the water engineering world. Um, so this extreme austerity, this focus on the bottom line, this focus on running a city like a business um, caused, um, you know, caused this crisis. Um, but it was also built on decades of disinvestment in infrastructure um, and really disinvestment in public health. Um, and it's not just a, a Flint problem. That's a problem that we see nationally. Um, and I want to really reiterate, and I, th I hope you garnered it from the video, um, that the people of Flint were not docile. Um, this, the, the people of Flint are the real heroes in the story. Um, when the water turned brown, when we had bacteria problems, um, when they had skin problems and all these issues, they were raising their voices. Um, they would hold their jugs of brown, wa brown water at town hall meetings, and they would get arrested um, because democracy was usurped. There was no role for people's voice in the process. And one of the basic tenets of environmental justice movements, um, is to have environmental justice, you must have people part of processes. You must have them part of especially environmental decision making. Um, and the people were not being listened to. They, they, they were loud, and they were vocal, and they were airing their concerns, and they were the absolute heroes and whistleblowers in the story. But nobody was listening to the people of Flint. And for 18 months, um, the people of Flint were literally actually told to relax. Um, so our Department of Environmental Quality is quoted as saying, just relax, relax. Everything is fine. We're, we meet minimal compliance um, while the people were drinking this contaminated water. And mind you, this was not a population 
that could afford alternatives. Um, so even if um, you know the mom and her gut senses that something's wrong with the water, this was not a population um, that could have afforded the alternatives. And that's what, where now we see a lot of, of, of the guilt in, in the population. Um, and at the same time that we were told to relax, um, General Motors, which is still in Flint, um, a year prior to our research going public, stopped using this water because it was corroding engine parts. Um, so the water that the people were told to drink up that is all fine um, was actually corroding engine parts. And that's really kind of when like fire alarm bells should have gone off in people's heads. Like if it's corroding engine parts, like what is it doing um, to our plumbing, which is predominantly lead based. Um, so, and, and I want to also reiterate, like it's mentioned in the video, so uh, I know there's some Michigan people. Who's from Michigan? Oh my God, there's Michigan people, that's awesome. So how do we represent our state? Okay, the hand, so point to where you're from or where you've been. All right, so we are, awesome, so we're in a mitten state. So here's Detroit, here's Flint, here's Grand Rapids, here's Lansing, uh, Traverse City. There's also the Upper Peninsula, but we forget about them, but there's an Upper Peninsula. So, so we use this hand because, why, because what are we surrounded by? Water! We are surrounded by the Great Lakes, and the Great Lakes are the largest source of fresh water in the world. In the world, the Great Lakes are the largest source of fresh water. And we are, here's Flint, we are literally in the largest source of fresh water in the world. So just let that, just digest that, because that is just absolutely mind boggling. Um, so like was mentioned, this untreated Flint water was 19 times more corrosive than the water that we had been getting from Detroit. And this corrosive water just created this perfect storm for lead that is in our plumbing to leach out into our water. And I want to kind of take a little historical dive now. Um, so lead in plumbing. So I'm a pediatrician with an environmental health background. I have this MPA. So I never thought that there was lead in plumbing. Uh, like we, I'd been trained in, in both my environmental health world and in my pediatric world that we, we should be obsessed with lead paint and lead soil and lead dust and all these households. I never thought that there's lead in plumbing. Um, but it should not have been a surprise. Um, what does the word, does anybody know where the word lead comes from? Plumen. Plumen. So the elemental symbol for lead is PB, which comes from plumen, which means plumbing. Um, it actually, lead actually means plumbing. So when the Romans built their aqueducts, they used lead plumbing. And many people actually hypothe hypothesize the demise of the Romans is because they used lead plumbing. Uh, they also like sprinkled lead on their food and everything. Um, so lead in water, lead in water disasters. Flint is not the first time that there have been lead in water issues. A decade ago, um, there was a huge lead in water crisis in DC that went on for, for even longer. Um, in uh, Bennington, Vermont, anybody from Bennington, Vermont? No? Okay, does anybody know where it is? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so in the 1970s, there was actually a lead and water uh, crisis disaster in Bennington, Vermont, uh, where children's pe or people's pets were dying, and they want to know why were pets dying. Um, and they did some more investigation and found these high lead levels. Um, it was, I guess it was a corrosive water source as well. Um, but if anybody wants some great bedtime reading, there's a book called The Great Lead Water Pipe Disaster. Um, it talks about 150 years of lead and water disasters um, around the world world. Um, in Sheffield, England, which is actually where I was born, um, there was a lead disaster, lead and water disaster in the 1890s. Um, and they noticed a lot of the women that were pregnant at the time lost their babies. Um, so because of that, they actually, um, the smart folks over there created one of the first abortion pills in the early 1900s in Northern England that was a lead pill. Um, so there have been lead and water disasters throughout history. We know we have lead in our plumbing. We were stubbornly slow as a nation to restrict lead in our plumbing. Not until 1986 did we restrict it from those service lines that go into our homes. But not until 2014 did we restrict lead from our fixtures, our brass fixtures. Um, those still, until 2014, still had lead in them. So there's lead in, in the plumbing that's, that's public, there's lead in private areas, and there's a lot of lead in people's premise plumbing, which is inside their homes. Um, so this is not just a Flint issue. Nothing as bad as Flint, but there's, there's lead throughout our plumbing, throughout the nation, especially in the Midwest um, and the Northeast. Um, so 
So when, it, when I heard the possibility um, of lead in the water, really from the incredible work um, that a team from Virginia Tech was doing. So Marco Edwards is this renowned water corrosion expert um, who uncovered the DC lead and water crisis about a decade ago. Um, he got a call from this amazing mom who found out that this mom figured out that Flint, she got the list of ingredients for the Flint water treatment, and she found out that Flint wasn't using corrosion control. Um, so she contacted him via Google. Um, um, and when he found that out, he packed his minivan overnight with graduate students um, and with supplies. Um, and he drove up to Flint from Blacksburg, Virginia, which is really like in the middle of the nowhere. Um, and I'm like, why is this guy from Blacksburg, Virginia coming up to Flint? Um, and then he, he used something called citizen science. So he empowered the people of Flint to collect water samples throughout the city. And then he analyzed those samples. And he found lead in every single part of the city. Um, and I, I heard about his work uh, through a friend. And I heard, you know, I'd heard people complaining about the water. Um, they'd come to clinic, you know, with like, you know, why does my water look like this? And should we do anything? And I was very much reassuring my patients because the state was reassuring us. They're like, oh, everything's OK. There's bacteria. They're treating it with this. There's this or that. Um, and then I never heard, had heard the word lead. Um, but when, when you hear the word lead as a, as a pediatrician, as anybody in public health, um, you kind of freak out because um, uh, it's probably the, one of the most well-studied neurotoxins we know, we've know we known what lead has done for centuries. Although today in the EPA, has it, did anybody, has anybody been following the EPA confirmation hearings today? So um, the nominee Pruitt actually said he doesn't know any scientific evidence, hasn't heard of any scientific evidence of lead. So that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> um, so it's probably one of the most well-studied neurotoxins. There's articles about lead toxicities that are hundreds and hundreds of years old. We know it's potent. We know it's irreversible. We know in the field of public health we're supposed to do something called primary prevention in lead, uh, which means a population should never be exposed to it because when they are exposed to it, there's not much you could do afterwards. When you, when a, you detect lead in a child, that just tells you there's an environmental problem. Um, so like was mentioned, we know it impacts cognition. We know it impacts behavior. We know it has these epigenetic impacts. Um, and now we've learned so, so much from science that we know uh, levels we thought were you know, safe back in the day. Um, we, know, we now know that there's no safe level. And, and we, we've also learned that it's the first increments of exposure that can cause um, the greatest detriment. So, so much great science has taught us and has guided us that there really is no safe level of lead. And I want to reiterate that the lead problem it's not just a flint problem. I saw some amazing presentations, you guys, at the public health, at the, at the poster session. Um, it's a problem everywhere um, because of um, legacy lead sources and, and some continued lead sources. Um, so it's kids in Flint that already had higher rates of lead exposure, kids in Detroit, kids in Chicago, kids in Philadelphia, kids in Baltimore. Some of our country's most vulnerable children um, already have and already burdened with higher rates of lead exposure um, and really every other toxic stress that threatens their future. It's an environmental injustice. It is a social injustice. Um, when I was an undergrad, I remember um, an environmental justice professor actually calling it environmental racism because it's some of our most, uh, it's usually our children of color, um, but really all children are impacted by something that is entirely preventable. Um, however, in Flint, this injustice only widened. Um, so like I said, when I heard about the possibility of lead in the water, um, my role as a clinician, very much kind of taking care of that one patient at a time, quickly morphed into a researcher. Um, I knew I had to have data in my pocket. Um, and I, what I did was not rocket science research. Um, like I said earlier, it's probably one of the re easiest research projects I've ever done in my life. Um, so we routinely screen, like you do, we routinely screen children for lead um, at the ages of one and two. We are mandated by Medicaid. Medicaid serves as a proxy for poverty. Um, so these are high risk kids anywhere. So we screen kids at the ages of one and two for lead. Um, so all we did was go back in time um, and look at our children's lead levels before the water switched and we care, compared them to children's lead levels after the water switch. Um, and usually in most states, lead levels are submitted to the state or county health departments. Um, and that's what I tried to get first. I tried to get lead levels from our county and our state health department, but I was getting nowhere. Um, but it turns out that my hospital um, is the only really shop in town, the only lab in town. And it turns out that we actually process most of the lead levels for the county. 
Um, so with an IRB that was submitted and approved in a day, which is amazing, um, <laughs> we were able to get um, children's lead levels. And another thing that is amazing is that we had gone um, EMR in 2011. We used EPIC everywhere. Um, so, um, and EPIC also claims this, this as a success story, but we were able to get our data requests back in two hours. Um, so there is a huge benefit to having readily accessible data and, and friends in the IT department. Um, so, um, so we looked back in time and what we found, um, like was mentioned, we found um, that the percentage of kids with elevated lead levels doubled after the water switch and we used elevated as five micrograms per deciliter or greater. Um, and in the areas where the water lead levels were the worst, we saw the greatest increase in children's lead levels. Um, we had the water lead data from, from Dr. Edwards from Virginia Tech, so where he had the greatest levels of water lead in certain parts of the city, um, that's where we saw the greatest increase in children's lead levels. So there was actually one area in the middle of the city um, where he had, um, where he saw over 30% of his samples exceeded the EPA's action level for lead and water. In that part of the city, our, um, our percentage of kids with elevated levels went from about 4.7 to about 16% of kids that were tested had elevated lead levels. So, so it directly, directly correlated. Um, and this, this increase in, in the kids' lead levels was really contrary to everything that was happening um, in our nation, in our state, and even in the city of Flint. We've done a great job in public health um, decreasing children's exposure to lead. Um, so what were the traditional old sources of lead exposure? Paint, what else? Soil, what else? Industrial, what else? Gasoline. gasoline, so gasoline was like one of the worst. Um, so we've done a great job of kind of phasing these things out. So we got lead out of gas, we got, despite an incredibly evil lobby at the time, um, we got lead out of paint, also an evil lobby who are, they're still trying to sue. Because unlike all the, some other evils, like asbestos and tobacco, the lead lobby, the lead industry has never been held accountable. They've never had to pay up for damages, although there's some great folks working on lawsuits. There's a lawsuit, I think, in California that's under appeal right now um, to have them pay up. Um, so there's all these legacy sources that we, we did a great job phasing out. So there's a beautiful graph of like the 30-year trend of children's lead levels, and it's been going down. It's a public health success story. Yet at the same time, like I said, science has taught us that there is no safe level of lead. Um, so, and there's significant disparities in lead. So it's certain kids that have these higher rates. Um, and in some communities in Philadelphia and Detroit, the percentage of kids tested far exceeds even 15%. Um, and right now, the reference level for, for for lead is five micrograms per deciliter, and just a couple of weeks ago, the CDC, CDC said they're gonna take that down to three and a half micrograms per deciliter. Um, so no level is a safe level. Um, so, so as a clinician, I quickly became a researcher, and then once seeing these findings, um, I quickly had to become an advocate um, because this this was an emergency. Um, you don't mess around with kids. Pediatricians don't mess around with kids. You can't mess around with pediatricians, um, and you don't mess around. You don't mess around with lead. Um, and uh, what do you do when you guys do research? You guys all these great research projects. So what in the academic world? Like when we do great research, like what's our goal? Like. We publish. Where is Dr. First still here? So, so we publish, right? We publish. Um, we couldn't wait to publish. Uh, so this was not something that we could sit on. This is not something we could wait really another day on. Um, so we did something that really doctors don't really do. Um, we had a press conference. Um, we, we shared our findings at a press conference because we had this very moral, this very ethical, this very professional obligation to let the public know what our concerns are um, so that they could take precautions. They could get a filter, they could use bottled water, um, all these precautions so that their children um, would not be exposed. Um, and as a pediatrician, uh, and as a physician, it's, it's, it's our job. It's our job to be advocates. Um, I, my, job, my other job is I'm this residency director, so I train, I get the privilege of training our, our pediatric residents. Um, and it is in, it's in our curriculum to train them to be advocates. They have rotations and community pediatrics and advocacy. So it is in our job description um, to be advocates for children, and especially to be advocates for children in a community where their voice has gone largely voiceless um, in underserved communities. Um, so uh, you have to use your very credible voice sometimes in your communities, and, and we'll, get to, uh, we'll get to more of that later. 
Um, but by and large, um, pediatricians have historically been the ones to, to raise their voices for kids. Kids can't vote, although I wish they could have list last time. They can't say I need better gun protections. They can't say I need immunizations. So it is often the role of pediatricians um, to be advocates for children. Um, so what, when we had this press conference, it was, it was not something, there was, really it was like a choiceless choice. It was something that we had to do to, to be an advocate, to, to inform our community what was going on. Um, and when I, I stood up with the proof um, that this Flint River water was causing lead to leach into the bodies of our children, um, the state of Michigan tried to discredit me. So there's some great words. Uh, they called me an unfortunate researcher, um, that I was causing near hysteria, um, and that their numbers didn't add up with my numbers. Because remember, the state gets all of these numbers. Um, and it just it was a continuation of um, the dismissal of the problem. So they, were, they had discredited the people of Flint, the moms, the activists, the pastors, the journalists, the water scientists, um, everybody um, had been dismissed to this point. Um, but we, we fought back. Um, you know, this we were fighting, you know, for our kids, for their lives, for their future. Um, and, and this was not a fight we could lose. And, and finally, the, the, the tide did turn. Um, and it was, it's unfortunate that you, they needed evidence that the children were actually being poisoned. It should have stopped when that first mom at that first town hall raised that jug of brown water. Um, and then really quite suddenly, my, my life took a turn that I wasn't expecting. Um, so like I said before this, pretty much all of my work was, was one on one. Uh, small hands in mine, uh, little ears in front of me, tiny noses to peek into. Um, but sometimes the work that you choose has different plans um, for you. So instead of one on one, I was very much faced with kind of one on thousands um, and really facing kind of the dire needs of um, of so many. And I very much feel like I was just kind of serendipitously placed where I was. And I was, I was lucky to have had an environmental health, environmental health background, a public health background. I'd had advocacy training. It wasn't the first time um, I talked to the media. Um, and really, it was all those little noses and ears um, and hands that, that prepared me um, to, to do more and to, to do something bigger. Um, because it was those, those noses and ears um, and those hands that grounded me and that reminded me that every little number in my research um, was a kid. And it was probably a kid that I had seen within the last year or two. Year or two. Um, and that inspired me. Um, and that really kind of um, allowed me to further fight for my kids, to further be an advocate um, for my patients. And here's kind of where I want to digress a little bit and share a little bit about me, which I don't usually share. Um, but I think with kind of the current political climate, and since we're celebrating um, MLK and how he truly, um, how he has, how he espoused uh, diversity, um, I want to share um, how I, I feel like I was born almost a fighter as well. Um, I was I was born. Um, into a family that was already on the move away from something, um, towards something better. Uh, I was born into a life very much knowing there was injustice in the world and knowing the need to always fight for justice. Um, so I'm an immigrant. Um, you can, maybe you can tell from my brownness um, and my long name. Uh, so I wasn't born here. So we're, I'm Iraqi American. We came to this country um, when I was about five. Uh, my parents fled uh, Saddam Hussein, who at that time was this brutal dictator of Iraq. Um, the senseless Iran-Iraq war was just about to start and would kill about a million people. Um, so my parents were progressives. They, um, they saw and kind of really feared the rise of fascism in Iraq, and uh, they could probably look ahead and see what was probably the next 35 years of a slow and bloody spiral into anarchy. Um, so we were basically refugees. Um, I saw some great projects on refugees um, as well. Um, and we were very much welcomed into the fabric of this country. Um, and I hope the same um, could be said today. Uh, my mom um, taught English to recent English to recent immigrants. She was an English as a second language teacher. My dad worked for the General Motors um, as an engineer, um, and they provided a better life um, for their kids. For, so for my family, um, the American dream very much um, became a reality. Um, but the America um, that I woke up in this morning, and and really for the last year, um, has changed a lot since I was a little girl. Uh, and some things haven't changed at all. So people are still running to America. It is still the epitome of prosperity for the entire world, the richest country that ever was um, and ever has been. 
but you can say there are two Americas, the America I was lucky to grow up in, um, and the America that I really see every day in my clinic. Um, and I have seen things I wish I had never seen. These are not first world issues that you are supposed to see. Things that you run from, not towards. Things that would never be part of any nightmare, let alone a dream. And for too many people, for too many of our kids, um, this nightmare is taking place right outside of our front doors. Um, but this nightmare um, has to be our nightmare. We are in this together, and I want to quote MLK. He said, we may have all come here on different ships, but we're all in the same boat. And this is really kind of um, what we hope to uh, learn from and, and live from, especially in Flynn, and, and I think this is how we begin our story of, of healing um, and of hope. Uh, we are very much in Flint working towards hope. Uh, I've often said we're writing prescriptions for hope. Um, when families come to me, often the best thing I can provide them in that, that well child visit is, is reassurance and hope. Um, and really from the moment that we, we proved that lead was increasingly in the bodies of our children, our, our focus shifted to tomorrow. It has shifted to how do we best preserve um, the tomorrows of our children. Um, and I am so lucky every day um, to serve my kids as a pediatrician. I think I have the absolute best job in the world. Um, and I am lucky now to be able to lead this initiative, this pediatric public health initiative, where we're trying to create this model public health program, where we're trying to, to merge the disciplines of, of, of pediatrics and public health, um, where we're trying to really flip the outcomes for our children. We are wrapping our children with um, evidence-based interventions to promote their development um, and to mitigate the impact of this exposure. So things like family support services, uh, home visiting programs, early intervention, early literacy programs, universal preschool, school health services, nutrition access, and healthcare. Um, we are investing in our kids, um, especially our youngest and our most vulnerable. Um, and th this is not like a recipe that Flint needs. This is a recipe that all kids need. All kids need. Um, a huge investment, especially in that prenatal to preschool window um, when their brains are developing, um, especially kids exposed to adversity, because that's really when you can, you can mitigate, mitigate and buffer all sorts of adversity, be it lead exposure, be it poverty, be it lack of nutrition, be it violence. Um, so Frederick Douglass uh, is an abolitionist from over 150 years ago. And he said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Um, so we are definitely taking his line. It's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And anybody who has worked in any hospital setting and rotated all over the place, you go to the adult floors, no offense to the adult floors, these adults have a whole list of chronic diseases and it's really hard to take care of all those things and to reverse them. But you go to a peds floor and the kid, you know, they, they bounce back. You have an opportunity to prevent a lot of the issues. Uh, so it's very much a focus on prevention, prevention, prevention. Um, and in a city that used to build really, really strong cars, we used to build, we still do build really, really strong cars. Our focus now is really on building really, really strong kids. Um, but this is not enough because um, to truly fix Flint and really Flint everywhere, um, we have to get to the root of the issues. We have to get back to rebuilding um, that American dream um, because the most important medication that I can prescribe to my kids um, and to my families is to lift them out of poverty um, as we strive for equity, as we strive for justice, um, as we strive for opportunity. And it's not just an economic labor issue. It's a public health issue, um, and it is definitely an American dream issue. And we are not naive in Michigan to think that all of our manufacturing jobs are going to come back. Um, but a new economy, an economy based on health care and education and recovery, um, must also be an economy um, that creates that, that grand bargain that we talked about um, between labor and capital, or focus, a renewed focus on that living wage um, to help us create economic prosperity. Um, and this is not just in Flint, but everywhere because parents with living wage jobs um, are probably one of the most important things that we could be doing for kids. Like, they're like, why is a doctor talking about living wage jobs? It's all related. Um, and we really need to, to, to look at and address all these things if we want our families to be healthy. 
So this is where Flint's struggle um, is, is your struggle, is everyone's struggle. There are towns like Flint everywhere, um, from the Rust Belt to southern textile towns to coal country and beyond, um, where children are waking up to that same nightmare. Um, and when you are born into a situation stacked against you, like poverty, um, every little thing, uh, sometimes things as simple as a meal uh, or clean water um, can be a fight and that American dream can seem so, so out of reach. Um, but that dream that was first born in Flint um, and that dream that I was lucky to wake up to as an immigrant needs to be for everyone, not just a select few. And it is the same dream that MLK was fighting for um, and died for. And this dream is for the children of Flint, of Chicago, Detroit, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Vermont, um, we owe it to them and with the right tools and resources, it is absolutely within their reach. Um, as a pediatrician, I think anybody who works with kids, we know or has kids, we know that children are so resilient. Um, but sometimes they need our voice um, and they absolutely need our strength to help them dream of that better tomorrow. And this is where we need your voice um, and we need your strength. Um, we especially need um, the respected and credible voice of medicine to continue to safeguard our communities, um, to fight against injustices, um, and to be public health advocates. We need your voice. Because someday, um, you will face an important choice. Um, you will have to decide whether to raise your voice. Um, the issue may not be the poisoning of a town, uh, may not be as momentous as that, but um, like I said, there are flints everywhere. There are injustices everywhere. There are people and places that will need you, all of you, to raise your voices. Um, you can choose to stay silent, uh, just go with the flow, and that's obviously in most, is that's the easiest thing to do. It's easiest socially, economically, politically, academically uh, to just kind of go with the flow. Um, and trust me, it's not always easy to raise your voice. Um, your heart rate goes up. You stop sleeping, there's a knot in your stomach that won't go away. Um, but I urge you, do not fear uh, um, the opportunity to raise your voice. Do not fear being the dissenter, wh whether you are fighting small injustices or large. Um, because when you are old and infirm, years and years from now, um, and you you'll look back on your life, um, you're not going to tell yourself, I wish I had stayed silent. You will say, I am proud uh, that I raised my voice and that I stood up for what was right. I, I want to kind of bring it, bring it back to MLK. So in, in 1967, uh, exactly one year before he was assassinated, um, Martin Luther King had a choice to make. He was a dozen years into standing up and raising his voice in the fight for civil rights. But he also believed the Vietnam War was wrong. But he was warned that fighting against the Vietnam War was one step too far and that he would lose the allies he needed in the civil rights fight. On April 4th, 1967, MLK gave a speech where he said he couldn't be silenced about the Vietnam War. He said dissent isn't disloyalty. He said the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in a period of moral crisis maintain their neutrality. The hottest places in hell are reserved for those in a period of moral crisis maintain their neutrality. Think about that. 20 years after the genocides and brutality of World War II, MLK said that the hottest places in hell are not for the mass murderers or the tyrants, but it's for those of us who do not raise our voices against injustices. And we cannot be a nation. We cannot be a profession that is okay with injustice. Because also, as MLK said so eloquently, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So remember, MLK was shot when his civil rights movement was broadening with the workers' right movement, with the anti-war movement. He was in Memphis in support of striking sanitation workers. He understood the interconnectedness of issues of race and poverty and economics and public health and the environment, the same connections we see in Flint and, and throughout this country. So as we reflect on the incredible, incredible work um, and incredible words of MLK, um, it's hard not to see how they resonate today. They are absolutely applicable today. 
Um, in a couple of days, we are, embark we are about to embark in a, into a great unknown, um, and an unknown where we have the potential to see many more flints. The credibility of science is under attack from vaccines to climate change. Safeguards for our most vulnerable are threatened. Regulations and public health agencies like the EPA are at risk of being dismantled. And healthcare access for millions may disappear. This is happening right now. Um, this, to me, is a public health crisis. Um, and we need all of you to be advocates. We need all of your voices. Mark my words, in the days, weeks, and months ahead, there will be many instances that if we don't raise our collective voice, our values, people's lives and livelihoods, and what's left of the American dream will be at risk. I'm almost done. So I want to end um, by reminding you that you may not be hearing much about Flint um, anymore, but we are still very much in the middle of our crisis. Um, we, to this day, on our third year, um, the kids I see in my clinic cannot drink water out of their tap. It must be filtered. Um, and keep in mind, this is in the richest country in the world, in the middle of the Great Lakes. It's, it's still absolutely mind-boggling. But I also want to remind you that Flint is tough. Uh, we have incredible history. We have incredible grit. We have incredible resilience. And in years from now, I hope, I hope to come back and share how through our loud voices and through our collective action, um, we were able to proactively and positively invest in our kids and in our community. We hope to share how that investment helped rebuild that American dream, um, that American dream that was first born in Flint, and that American dream that MLK fought and, and, and died for. Um, and it's that American dream that we all need to continue be to be fighting for um, every day, especially now, um, for all of our kids. Thank you. I would love to take questions <coughs> about anything. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, come back. We need you. Uh, <laughs> but I have family and um, Why'd they move? Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay, the water. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I went back to Detroit this year for Christmas, and um, I've noticed that there's a lot of great things happening in Detroit. Yeah, the absolutely. Um, back. Um, but I, I don't really see the same thing happening in Flint. And it's like Flint's getting up. You just got a lot of this in Detroit today over the past year. So why do you think that this, the, the slow changes are happening in Flint? I mean, it's not happening as fast as it's been. Sure. So the question is, uh, so what's your name? Chris. Chris is from Detroit, uh, and he went back home, and he saw this great renewal and reinvestment in Detroit. Um, and why do we not see that in Flint? Uh, so many reasons, uh, and Detroit is actually, it's called the comeback city. Uh, it was absolutely, it was bankrupt, um, and a huge investment in the city, and jobs coming back, and sports teams, and what have you, um, and lots of people with lots of money. So there's a guy in Detroit called Dan Gilbert, who's, who, who owns uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers and, and uh, Quicken Loans, that has dumped lots and lots of money into that city, and gotten people to also uh, bring back resources and money into the city. Um, so that's one of the reasons, and, and Detroit's also a larger population. However, the struggles in Flint have also resonated um, in, in Detroit, um, especially in Detroit schools. So Detroit schools are in absolute disarray, and Detroit schools were actually also under emergency management, and actually it was the same emergency manager in Flint that went to Detroit public schools, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, so the, the, the Flint cause um, has enabled some um, greater publicity and resources to actually go to that cause. It's still not enough, um, but it's a great beginning. But why, why don't you think, why do we not think Flint may have that rebound? So Flint's population 
um, is a lot smaller. So in 2014, it was the first time that our population dipped under 100,000 um, from a peak of almost 300,000 at kind of the heyday of the auto industry. Uh, at one point, General Motors employed 80,000 people in Flint, and that's down to less than 5,000. Um, so that was actually part of the water problem. Our water infrastructure was built for a huge population, a population twice our size. So there was a lot of stasis of, of the water in the plumbing, um, which increased the exposure of the corrosion and leaching of lead in the water. Um, so there's a lot of efforts to bring a rebound in Flint. There's a new revitalized downtown. There's a new health and wellness district. We have a brand new pediatric clinic that's actually on the second floor of a brand new farmer's market in downtown Flint um, to kind of address food insecurity and transportation issues. Um, so there is a kind of a revitalization. It won't be as much. We don't have as many resources as Detroit. But there's a lot of us that are hoping to really use this water crisis as an opportunity to flip the story around in Flint. Because like you heard earlier, our stats and our disparities were terrible before the water crisis. And then we had the water crisis. So then can we use this as an opportunity to really flip the entire story for our children, to get these kids what they've needed for decades. Um, and, and a lot of that is jobs. So now there is actually jobs in Flint. There's early education workers and school health workers and researchers and um, other things that are coming back in the city. So don't hold out hope. Come back in five, 10 years, and we'll show you kind of a new Flint. Other questions? Yes, sir. Has Flint found alternative ways to obtain water than from water bottles? Uh, the question is, has Flint found alternative ways to uh, obtain water rather than water bottles? Um, so the preferred method is actually filters. Uh, there's filters that attach to your faucet, the end of your faucet, or this pitcher filters that where the water goes through the pitcher. Um, these filters clear the majority, the lead. They work, they even work. They were only NSF certified to clear 150 parts per billion, but in Flint we had many water lead samples that were in the thousands of parts per billion. They were retested by EPA and independent scientists and they still clear those, the lead samples, lead and water samples that are in the thousands of parts per billion. Um, so that is the preferred method because water bottles, the water in your water bottle, you, it's, it's, uh, you don't know what you're, you don't know how great that is either. This is, um, spring water actually has no disinfectant in it, so there's bacteria issues. Um, and uh, bottled water is managed, regulated by the FDA, and they're only set to clear five parts per billion of lead. So, so filters are the preferred method. method. Filters are not easy to use. They're difficult to install and they're difficult to maintain because you also have to, you have replacement cartridges for your filters. Whenever too much lead has gone through your filter, or a light comes on and you have to replace a filter, with, replace a cartridge. Many families in Flint are on their like 11th or 12th replacement cartridges. Um, but all the filters, the replacement cartridges, and the bottled water are available uh, from the government right now. But it's not ideal. Paid for by the government? Yeah. So this is a neurotoxin that's been strongly associated with aggressive behavior and mental health problems. So along the lines of what you were saying a few paragraphs ago, does this open up new opportunities to improve mental health? Absolutely. Services? Yeah, so the question was um, lead is a neurotoxin. It impacts cognition, but behavior, it's been linked to aggressive behavior, conduct disorder, criminality. Um, so have we been able to kind of invest uh, in, in our mental health resources? Absolutely. Uh, so we've been able to increase the capacity of our pediatric behavioral health services. Uh, we just got a large grant from SAMHSA, which is the National Mental Health Association, on resilience building. Um, and we have a, now a 24-hour crisis line for our families. So the most common thing that we see right now is the trauma and the stress of this crisis. Um, so families are, are, are scared. They are angry. They are absolutely angry. Um, and, and they are guilty. They gave their kids this water. They didn't know or they knew. Um, and, and they are stressed and traumatized. So it's the mental health issues that we are seeing acutely now. Um, and we have been able to build in some additional resources um, for the treatment and the management and the mitigation of the mental health resources. Um, you mentioned that um, this whole thing kind of started with how the government kind of just made an emergency decision to restructure um, in a financially sound way. Is um, Flint still at risk um, for something like this happening again, or have there been safeguards put in place? And are, again, on top of that, are there other like cities that have kind of fell, fell victim to this kind of um, lack of democracy, as you said? Yeah, so the question was about the emergency management rule, the emergency manager rule. Flint is only one of a few states who has, Michigan is one of the only few states who has 
this kind of rule where you can come in and kind of usurp democracy and, and do whatever you want. Um, the city council in Flint actually voted uh, to, like, we want to go back to Detroit Water, Detroit Water and emergency managers like, oh, whatever, I, I, I can do whatever I want. I don't have to listen to you. 